you know, yeah, is the, the internet here. Is okay. Now we're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming back. You know, we always wonder after session one if anyone's going to come back for session two. So we've got a great session two group and more people online too. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're really grateful, Rabbi Lyon, for leading this series and uh, for continuing. If you didn't get to hear the first uh, session, I, I hope it's not prerequisite for today. Uh, but if you want to hear the recording, it's available. Just let me know. We'll be having, happy to send that to you. It's also on our website uh, and on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to find all of those recordings, too, along with last time as well as this time. The, set, the third session will be on February 5th in two weeks. So please, uh, you know, we'll rinse, wash, and repeat. More food to come. Uh, next time too, uh, for those of us who are in the room. If you haven't yet registered for Saturday evening program, this is our Fleischmann family event. We're welcoming Michael Feinstein to our congregation and to our community. We have 975 people already registered, so it will be packed. It will be packed. It's going to be amazing. So uh, please uh, arrive early. You'll get more information. But if you haven't yet registered, please do so, so you have all the up-to-date details about Saturday evening's performance. And with that, Rabbi Lyon, Great. thank you. Thank you, David. I'm so glad to see you back uh, around the table. As David said, which, you know, it's, the first time is, is good, but the second one has to bring everybody back. So I see. <laughs> Are, are back and some people too, and I'm glad that you're on Zoom, those who are listening from wherever you are. Um, before we jump into our subject today, today is Tu Bishvat. This is Jewish Arbor Day. So I, I don't know who brought this, um, uh, Carolyn Gill. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you need a pine tree. <laughs> Well, It'll take a while to grow. I'm glad I don't need it today. <laughs> we'll give it time and we'll nurture it. Tu Bishvat is the day when we appreciate all the things that grow in Israel. Um, and uh, we plant trees in Israel. And God knows there's a lot of planting that's needed. Seeds of peace and seeds of hope, for sure. Um, our subject today takes us to the fifth chapter of Martin Luther's book, The Way of Humanity. And... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a marvelous chapter, and one of the reasons I chose it is it helps us to appreciate the way Buber wants us to see ourselves in the context of the world. And unfortunately, uh, we're all the products of an American culture. And American culture says, me, me, me. It's all about us, about our ego. And if we don't take care of ourselves, then... Um, you know, everything else uh, is something is wrong about it. So we're always trying to improve ourselves, the best version of ourselves, we're told. And Boober says, in effect, get over yourself. Uh, <laughs> let's put ourselves in the proper perspective of the world and reorient ourselves properly. So I think today is actually more challenging because we're going to have to try, if we can, to unplug and maybe uh, download version 2.0, uh, which is so much easier in technology and not so easy with the human mind and conscience and heart and soul. Um, it isn't a prerequisite and it's not a demand, but it is an exercise in helping us to properly orient ourselves towards the world that God has created and that we didn't create, but we have a, a remarkable responsibility to the world around us. So the handout that I have provided you, and if you don't have one there, let's just um, be sure that everybody does have one. Um, no response. Thank you. And David is going to share on Zoom uh, for those who are online. So at the top of the page, I simply um, crossed out last time's uh, today is not to be preoccupied with oneself from chapter five. And next time when we meet on February 8th, hear where one stands. So let's begin by looking at the text Hooper provides for us at the, at the top of chapter five. And I'll read it aloud because it needs some commentary and then we'll break it down in all of its subsequent parts. So he writes this beautiful tale about Chaim of Zanz married off his son to the daughter of Rabbi Eliezer. The day after the wedding, Rabbi Chaim came to the bride's father and said, in-law, now that you are close to me, I can speak to you of the pain in my heart. Look, my hair and beard are already grizzled, and I have yet to do penance. But Rabbi Eliezer replied, my dear in-law, you only think of yourself. Forget yourself. 
and have the whole world in mind. So we have to break it down, and Booker is very concerned about the way each of us orients to the world around us. We did mention last time very briefly, and I'll mention it just briefly again, maybe we'll have another class on it later, the I, it, and I bow that Bloomberg had originally written about and many people are familiar with was a way of helping us to orient to other people and to recognize that within the I, thou relationship is always present the eternal thou. That's the goal that we want to reach is to be somewhat related to and more consistently committed to the eternal thou. Because Bloomberg put very famously the eternal, God is always present and we are sometimes absent. And so that's the gap that we want to fill. And I think today's lesson in chapter five will, will do that. So um, let's continue. So what's said here, um, Buber says, appears to contradict everything that we have related up until now concerning Hasidic teaching. Because Hasidic teaching is all about engaging yourself, empowering yourself with the joy of Jewish learning, the joy of everything that God has given us. And yet what he's already suggesting here is constrict, contract that ego, uh, leave room for other things. So let's go on and see what he has to teach us. He says, we have heard that everyone should have self-awareness. All of us should select our particular way. Remember from last time that each of us can choose our independent way to God because every way that we choose is good if it leads to God. I think I could say, as I know many of you around the room, there isn't anybody here who is on the wrong path or on the wrong way, but each of us chooses his or her own individual way. And as I might have said before, the only thing a rabbi can truly say authentically is that when we speak of God, we can only speak of one God, not two, not three, and not none. But what's also important is that the way you imagine God for yourself is the way you should imagine God for yourself. I can't tell you how to see God, imagine God, pray to God, or relate to God. That is up to you, and it comes and goes in the course of our life. So um, uh, the first statement that's on your page, number one, relates to something that he has written in his chapter. He says, to begin with ourselves, but not to end with ourselves. So the idea is we ask ourselves a question, which he writes, to what purpose? Why were we born? So he says to begin with ourselves for sure, because we can't begin with anybody else. Uh, even as Hillel taught, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? So we begin with ourselves, but we can't end with ourselves, which is challenging to us as Americans raised in the culture we find ourselves in. And especially in today's culture, all the more so, because the egos that drive leadership and politics and outcomes is really uh, in contrast to what Buber is teaching us. So we have to challenge ourselves today. So we don't end with ourselves, which means that there's a lot of room at the end of that sentence for many, many other issues and people and outcomes um, in the world around us. But let's go to the next statement. He says, a wise, pious, helpful Saudi, a righteous person, advanced in years, overrates his transgressions and underrates the penance he has done for them. So what Boomer wants us to understand is that even a righteous person, a person who is so dedicated to following the teachings of God and the mitzvot, can get it wrong by underestimating and overstating is, and I'll use the word his, because those were the tzaddikim that he's relating to, um, the tzaddikim who uh, thought too much of themselves. So I want to share with you, um, there is, um, at the bottom of the page, um, it says Jewish Kabbalah. There is a wonderful uh, story about a Rabbi Eliezer, a different Rabbi Eliezer, who um, is in a coach, in a carriage. And it turns out that it needs to be pushed down the road. And the people are talking outside the carriage about this great man who has to be pushed in the carriage. And Rabbi Eliezer sticks his head out the window and says, who is this great person? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's you. And when they realized that they had elevated him, 
in such a way he got out of the carriage and began to push the carriage too. Because what he said, and I wrote it at the bottom of the page, and we'll go back up to the others. The one who thinks he's something is nothing. But the one who knows he's nothing is really something. <laughs> now, true. Just let that sit with yeah. you. That's true. Mm -hmm. Somebody who thinks he's really something has missed the point about how to start with yourself but not end with yourself. There's more out there that needs to be accomplished. If you're really something and you think you're something, then you've missed the point. And so you're nothing. But if you know you're nothing, which is not to overstate it, but if you know that you're a modest, humble human being, then you're really something, okay? So we have to find always in moderation. And Judaism always uh, really impresses on us that it isn't the extremes where we find our strength. It's always in the reasonable center where humility uh, is important. Uh, we need ego when it's needed because we have to sometimes uh, present in a, a classroom like this. And I need a little bit of ego to stand in front of you and know that I can do this. But humility, I know that I might get it wrong and that I have a great responsibility to teach you. So we have to find our reasonable center and that's the point of the Kabbalah, the mystical teaching. It says, if you think you're something, you're not much. <laughs> you know you're not much. <laughs> now you're not. <laughs> they are completely different than the way you... <laughs> Okay. So um, number three says, in this Hasidic tale, we see a wise, pious, helpful tzaddik who in his advanced years rebukes himself that he has not yet achieved true transformation. This is the kind of the goal of the righteous person, to be improving himself constantly along the way. But he's now older in age. He says, I don't have much time left, and I haven't done enough for true transformation. The answer given to him clearly expresses the view that he overrates his transgressions and underrates the penance he has done for them. But beyond that, there's a more general message. So here's number three. Do not torture yourself constantly about the wrongs you have done. And do not waste your inner strength on self-incriminations. In effect, we're saying, get over yourself. <laughs> they weren't that bad, and you're not so awful. And so don't overrate and don't underestimate either. Instead, direct your inner strength to affect the world as you were destined. Do not be preoccupied with yourself, rather occupy yourself with the world. So I, I will share um, a, a story. Uh, there was a, a gentleman in the congregation who died about a year ago. So I, can, I will not reveal his name, but I'm not concerned about you know, calling him out either. Um, he called me into his office, um, and I went over to see him. And he had received a very bad diagnosis, and he knew that he would be gone within about three to six months. So. Um, I was his rabbi, and he was literally confessing to me and looking for some uh, validation that he uh, had not failed completely in his life, even though he knew in his heart that he had transgressed in some pretty remarkable ways. So he, um, he didn't tell me the details. I'm glad I don't know them. <laughs> but he did share with me that he felt over the years he had failed and stumbled and really committed some wrongs against people that challenged him. And now that he was facing his mortality, um, he wanted to come clean. And he wanted to know from me that he would be OK. And by that, he meant he doesn't know what's coming after this life. And he was, didn't know whether there was heaven or hell. We didn't talk about those things specifically, but given the business that he had conducted, the industry that he had contributed to, um, I was able to say to him, in effect, and I wouldn't have said it so bluntly, but in effect, I wanted to say, get over yourself. <laughs> uh, the things that you had done wrong, now you acknowledge. But along the way, in the course of his life and business, he had built and constructed and did things in such a meaningful, ethical, thoughtful way to be sure that human beings who lived in the places he was building 
would have the right kind of lives that they needed. He took such meticulous care about people's lives and the, and the roof over their heads. So we use that as a means of helping him to not to overstate his wrongs and also to give himself the ability to uh, re re forgive himself and to know that God would forgive him too because he did think outside of himself by being generous with the way he did his business and conducted it and also by being generous financially and philanthropically in the city and around the country. So in the end of the conversation, in effect, he wanted to know, am I okay? Am I gonna be okay? And I said, as the old saying goes, you can't take it with you. <laughs> but what you take with you, and I said, when, when death comes, uh, you won't be in pain, you will be, comforted and you'll have the medication to make you um, at ease. And what you take with you is your faith and you take love. He said, you're a man of faith. <clears throat> I can't say he had a perfect scorecard in attendance, <laughs> but that's not how we keep score in Judaism anyway. But through his deeds and through his acknowledgement of where he failed, um, I said, you're okay. Uh, you take your faith with you. He was so comforted by the conversation, to be at ease with the life he knew he lived, with some wrongs that he had committed. But he didn't overstate them, or at least I didn't permit him to overstate them. But he didn't also underrate the teshuva or the acts of repentance that he had also committed um, in his uh, effort to do good business and to do good by people. So in effect, what we read at the bottom of that quote is, um, to not be preoccupied with yourself, rather, Occupy yourself with the world. And that's what he did, and that's what we can do too. And I would say, knowing him, and as large a person as he was, uh, quite industrious, if he can do it, then any of us can do it. <laughs> and nobody is perfect, and nobody needs to be perfect either. That's the nature of, of being human. Um, so let's get back to this word transformation. Um, that Saadi Kim wanted to transform themselves to arrive at a time and a place in their lives where they felt whole and holier. But I want to remind you, um, on Yom Kippur, when we fill the sanctuary, do you know what kind of people come to the sanctuary on Yom Kippur and the kind of people that God wants to see in the sanctuary? That's it. That's it. God doesn't need the tzaddikim, the ones who are perfect and all holy, to come in the sanctuary. In fact, our Judaism would say, shame on them. They're overrating themselves. The ones that God wants to see in the sanctuary are all of us who have stumbled or failed or erred along the way, and we want to participate in something to help orient ourselves to God and to the larger world of responsibilities that fall on each of us. Um, so uh, um, apropos of that, some of you might be aware of Abraham Joshua Heschel's book, The Sabbath. Um, if you haven't read it or you don't have it, it's a very, it looks about as thin as this one and also very accessible. In the introduction, uh, to the book, The Sabbath, there's this beautiful uh, explanation of how the Sabbath is uh, connected to the realm of time rather than the realm of space. But what Heschel says, and I have it on our paper, just under number three, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, on Shabbat, you're concerned not with the world <clears throat> of creation, but with the creation of the world. What he means by that, and what Buber is getting at also, is that the creation, the world of creation is something we participate in every day. We're constantly creating something, a friendship, uh, something at work, something that we make with our hands, an idea. We're always creating something every day, six days a week. But on the seventh day, the day of rest, God sanctified it. It tells us that in the Torah. And Heschel points out that the Sabbath is not connected to anything but the realm of time. All the other holidays are set according to the, the phase of the moon on the lunar calendar. But the Sabbath was designated by God and sanctified by time. So the day of the Sabbath is not a time of where we're, we're creating, but rather focusing on the world of the creation of the world, appreciating what is beyond us and we can't do anything about. 
So as Heschel and Buber sort of um, combine here, we appreciate um, even more that this transformation that we're aiming for is something about orienting ourselves to a world that's already been created. We can't do anything about it. We have to stand back and appreciate and feel a part of God's creation as well. Um, so let's, uh, let's go on to number four. It's important to understand well, Uber writes, what is meant here regarding transformation. Transformation is, re is the recognized core in the Jewish conception of the way of humanity. Transformation brings inner renewal and changes our place in God's world. So our transformed selves are raised above even the perfect tzaddik who does not know the abyss of sin. So as I said, we who come in the sanctuary on Yom Kippur are not perfectly righteous. We are better than the perfectly righteous because we even participate in the act of teshuva, of repentance, places us above the person who thinks he's perfect. Okay? Additionally, transformation here means much more than regret and penance. And here um, on the paper it says, transformation means that we humans who have lost ourselves in the confusion of our egotism, who have constantly made ourselves the goal, and finally find our way to God by turning our entire being around. That means finding our way to fulfill the unique task that God has ordained for us as unique individuals. Regret can be no more than the motivation to activate the turning. Do you understand that? No. Yeah. So regret, <laughs> regret, which we sometimes feel. Um, how have you responded to regret in your life when you have felt either profound or less profound regret? Every day. Every day. So what does it, what does it cause you to do? Feel remorse. <laughs> try to make it better. All right. So we have two answers: either remorse and try to do better. And that's what Uber is suggesting. And our transformation, any sense of regret that we have, is the beginning of our motivation to turn and to do something better. So regret or guilt or remorse is very heavy in Judaism, but it's actually at the very start of a transformation that we can have to orient ourselves better to God. So I'll read that sentence again from his book. Regret can be no more than the motivation to activate the turning. And when I use the word, the way, remember that the title of this book is The Way of Humanity. Each of us individually needs to find our way, how to be our very best, but not without expecting that we have to constantly be improving and transforming. Isn't this kind of counter to the idea of the, the Jewish male is scholar who lives an internal life and studies constantly while uh, his women support him? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it just seems like the whole idea of the, I don't know if it's the Zodic or what, the guy that's studying all the time. And that's what he does. And he's the great rabbi. Yeah, um, I think Buber would be would join you in your criticism <laughs> of the structure of a very orthodox setting, mm -hmm. where where the the great scholar, the great rabbi, the great Saudi is considered to be perfect, if not like uh, like Schneerson is considered to be by some the Messiah. Mm -hmm. That would be completely contrary to what Buber wants us to understand, that the best people, the finest people are those who engage in transformation, constantly trying to improve themselves, but never, ever being God or deified or to be considered the Messiah. That would be a great mistake. Well, and not just to prove themselves, don't, aren't you saying they have to engage in the world? Really, and it isn't only engaging in teaching or learning, but more important is doing, is doing. Yes. So, Rabbi, is regret the same as shame from a Jewish perspective? It can be. You can use all those words, however you want to relate to it. Yeah, it goes back to, as Bloomberg uses the word, what is our motivation to turn and to begin transforming? 
if it takes shame or regret or remorse, guilt, um, any of those, if it motivates you to begin changing, transforming, to do something better and to be better to find your way, then, then that's it. But what have you said, if, if, you know, it's kind of, it hurts, it's depressing. I don't know how to get over it. The failure would be if we felt shame or regret or remorse and did nothing about it and just lived a life um, of guilt. Uh, that would be unfortunate and miss the point. So remember last week, we talked about the derech is the way. And each of us can find our own way. And as Buber said, each way is valuable as long as it leads to God. If it's connected to mitzvot, if it's connected to, to Jewish life, then you, the way that you choose to express yourself through social justice or adult education or worship or feeding the hungry or any other mitzvah is perfectly fine because it's a way that fulfills your <coughs> contribution to a world around you. And remember, we do the mitzvah for the sake of the mitzvah, mm -hmm. not the sake of the reward. Now, I will tell you, if, if you want to feel good about the mitzvah you've done, please feel good about the mitzvah. <laughs> I would never take that away. But we don't do it for the sake of the reward. We do it for the sake of the mitzvah. And if we remember that, that is the orientation to the world around us. But this constant feeding of the ego or, or making ourselves the center is not what Boober wants us to uh, walk away from if we learn this chapter correctly. Now, he acknowledges that the Hasidim, who were so intensely religious, but also filled with joy in serving God, sometimes got it wrong because they went into that inner self so deeply and forgot that it wasn't they who were so important, but the relation that they had with the world and ultimately with God who created it. Okay. Other questions? Okay, um, so let's, uh, um, oh, okay. So um, just to finish, it says, regret can be no more than the motivation to activate the turning, but torturing ourselves again and again with regret and agonizing over the inadequacy of our penance robs the turning of its effective strength. So I'm telling you today, my prescription for you is to stop guilting yourself, stop <laughs> torturing yourself because it's, it, will, it will prevent you from feeling motivated to do better and to transform yourself uh, to see that the world is a place that's forgiving. Now, I uh, digress for a moment because I want to share with you um, there's a beautiful midrash on the Psalms that is totally related to it. And actually in his book, um, what, what prompted me, and I, I, I can only guess that he was thinking of it, the same midrash, um, is uh, he writes in here, shun evil and do good. Turn away entirely from evil. Do not even think about it and do what is good. Have you been unjust? And act justly to counter it. It reminds me of somebody who came to my office once and he said, he's looking for advice. And he said, Rabbi, I just don't want to do the wrong thing. I really wanted to say, then don't. <laughs> Better. So I didn't say it. It's that easy. So, so it prompted me, and I he might have been thinking about there's this wonderful midrash. It's number five on your page. The Midrash begins with Psalm 34, where we read, who is the one who desires life? And that's everybody. That's you, that's me. Everybody desires life. And then he goes on to say, in the Midrash, this, this is not Buber, this is Midrash. This may be compared to the case of the peddler who used to go around the towns in the vicinity of Sephora, crying out, who wishes to buy the elixir of life? And we know what an elixir is. It's, it's snake oil. It's something that isn't necessarily reliable. And he draw, he's drawing great crowds around him because everybody wants the elixir of life. Who doesn't want it? Sitting and teaching in a study, Rabbi Yanai heard the peddler calling out, who desires the elixir of life? The rabbi said to him, come here and sell it to me. The peddler answered him, neither you nor people like you require what I'm selling. But the rabbi grew out of he pressed the peddler to sell it to him. So the peddler went up to him and brought out the book of Psalms. In the book, he showed the rabbi what is written immediately after the question, who desires the elixir of life? And written right there in Psalms after that question, it says, keep your tongue from evil, 
depart from evil and do good. Rabbi Yanai, surprised and awed, said, King Solomon too proclaims, whoever keeps his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Rabbi Yanai said, all my life, I've been reading this passage, but I didn't know how to explain it. Now this peddler came and made it clear to me. So within this Midrash, there are a lot of things that we can take from it. First of all, we are all people who desire life. And we're also prone to jump at those things that we think will give us the best life. What's new and improved, 50% uh, off, buy one, get one free. Uh, this one's yep. better, this one's older, whatever comes across the TV at 2 a.m. We're, <laughs> <on, laughs> we're running and buying and packages are being delivered. And you know what? We're still the same people we are. We're <laughs> loving and, and everything else. So he says, to really enjoy life, it comes down to much simpler things. And it really is about transforming ourselves from our insides to appreciate that we have regrets, but to use them as a motivation. And if we want to start in one particular place, even Rabbi Anai, who had been studying all his life, he said, this peddler brought it to me. I didn't even know it. How, if a peddler knew it, <laughs> all the more so the rabbi should have known it. And what is it? Keep your tongue from evil, depart from evil, and do good. So the reason the tongue is emphasized is that the tongue is the source of hearsay, rumor, and gossip. And in Hebrew, we call that Lashon Hara, or Lashon Hara. You've heard it either way, right? So Lashon Hara is the evil tongue. And the rabbis say that if we use rumors and gossip and hearsay, it really destroys the world around us. In fact, they say so much so that it just destroys the entire Torah. Because if we can't count on each other's word, honesty, integrity, and dignity, then nothing is left. So keep your tongue from evil. That's a strong start. Depart from evil. Rabbis say, if you take an unholy thing in your hand, in the Mishnah they say, if you take a lizard, a reptile, which is unkosher, in your hand, you say, I will repent, I will repent, I will repent, while holding a reptile in your hand, it doesn't count. <laughs> you can't say, I'm going to repent, and then go do the lousy thing again. You have to be true to your word. So keep your tongue from evil, depart from evil, and do good. It's not that difficult. It's a mitzvah. We know the difference between right and wrong. And ultimately, the ones who judge us will judge us, but they might not know the intention of our heart. The ultimate judge is God. So Buber is very inclined to help us see ourselves as less than what we thought we were, which is not a bad thing. But it's also important not to debase yourself. We're somewhere in the middle. And when we discover that we have so much, even as we stand in the middle, to contribute to the world that God has created, we don't want to be overwhelmed by that responsibility either. You might say, I'm inclining you to leave this room today to go serve the world. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> and there's too much. But in the corner of the world that you occupy, in the corner of the family where you serve, there is so much that you increasingly transform to become. First, you were parents, then you were grandparents, a niece, a nephew, and you were a neighbor, a teacher. All the different roles that you play constantly change, and that is transformation. And if you accept the stage and phase of your life, you'll discover how to do the very best that you can in it. Without remorse, without regret, do the best that you can. And if there is regret, then what should it serve as? Learning. A motivation. Exactly. Okay. Any thoughts or questions, Susan? Um, one of the things that, that I learned along the way um, is uh, the, the concept that you are not the worst thing that you have ever done. And huh? to not let what you perceive to be the worst thing, not to let that define who you are. Right, right, absolutely. Um, I think we've all been to therapy. Uh, <laughs> and the fact is that we need to, to be... Um, is that a Jewish thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why all the therapy it is a Jewish thing. He says it's the 11th commandment. It's the 11th, yeah. yeah. So, um, in reality, I think what Boober, who is so concerned about uh, human relationships, and human relationships that identify, reflect, and represent godliness is where he's heading. 
he was never only interested in us being at our very best. It was always for the sake of something larger than ourselves. And if in interactions and through deeds, we reveal a purpose that God has for us, then we've done it right. And we need to be motivated all the time to, in, to look for those opportunities for engagement. So without saying it here, the I, it, I, thou is, and if you're not familiar with it, I don't mean to use something that's over your head. An I, it relationship is like when the UPS driver comes and drops off the box, and takes a picture and proves that he delivered the package. And sometimes even in my house, I'll open the door and I'll want to say hi. And he said, he doesn't say anything. He's got a route to finish. Mm -hmm. It's a completely utilitarian relationship. It has no meaning. It has no connection. Uh, when you pick up your Starbucks order and they call your name out wrong and you pick up your coffee and you say, thank you. And they just turn around to go make another espresso. <laughs> That's <laughs> not it. It's not it but I vow is really engaging with somebody. And when you have that conversation, even at Starbucks with the barista, you make a connection. And for just that moment, you're really kind of lost and, and feeling something. The minute you step out of it, it's I it. So Buber says that every I thou is always fated to become an I it. Um, we have to engage, we have to initiate something. But within the I thou is always present the eternal thou. So when you really have that moment with somebody and then you go home and you think about it, that's I it at that moment. But what you had was I thou. And you don't lose anything. You don't give up anything of yourself in an I that relationship. You walk away with more than you came. But the idea that Buber brings always, he's always aware of that which is larger than ourselves, the eternal vow. And so when he talks about this uh, regret and shame as a motivation of transformation, um, it's always with the intent to be closer with, or at least cognizant of God. Now, I will say to all of you, I'm not going to test your faith. That's not my job. Uh, as I said, you can imagine God any way you want to, as long as you're only imagining one. <laughs> you're imagining two or three, we've got a problem. <laughs> but a, a congregant, a potential congregant came to me years ago when I served another congregation. I think I told you, he said to me, I don't know if I can join the congregation. I said, why not? What's the problem? He said, I'm not sure I believe in God. I said, do you believe in the possibility of God? He said, yes. I said, then you can join the God. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> faith doesn't come first. Yeah. It's really the way of humanity to <laughs> find ourselves on. <laughs> it brings us closer to God because we understand what God is commanding us to do and to be. So through transformation, by appreciating what guilt can motivate us to do, uh, we're finding our path. We're finding our way. Now, do you, anybody here, expect to find God? <laughs> I, I hope not. It would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of your life, when you know that it's the final, uh -huh. somehow or other, people, that spark of divinity comes to yeah. you. So, as I always say, no one has come back to tell us right. what there is, but we can believe that we take our faith with us and that there's a, a place of peace and, and joy and all right. of that. But if you were to say, well, I found God, I would want to know, well, now what? <laughs> what do I do with God? When did you lose it? <laughs> now what? What are you going to do with it? So I was once called to my professor's office in rabbinical school, um, uh, uh, Dr. Mahali of blessed memory in Cincinnati. And he said, David, I have a question for you. I'm like, oh, dear God. <laughs> dear God. Uh, Yom Kippur is coming. What does Yom Kippur mean? And I'm like, oh, an easy question. I'm sure. off the hook. I said, it means the day of atonement. And he said, wrong. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> the day of forgiveness. I was, I was just trying to throw anything at him. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I said, well, then I'm here to learn from you. So he said, it's the day of cleansing. That's what it is. Now, we can leave that aside. Why is it not the day of atonement? And he told me, and I'm going to tell you. Because atonement says, at one minute. Look at, think of the word, mm -hmm. how it's spelled. Atonement means at one minute. So the idea that we're coming on Yom Kippur to be forgiven by God and to be at one with God, he said, is a misconception. It's a misconception. We're missing the mark if we think we're going to be at one with God. We can't. 
God is God and we are created in God's <laughs> image to be on this path, this way of humanity that we choose for ourselves to be at the very best that we can. But what the brilliance of Judaism is that we're always forgiven. The opportunity for repentance doesn't end with the end of Yom Kippur. It's constant every day. Every Shabbat is called a Yom Kippur Katan, a small Yom Kippur. And the idea of being in God's presence is available to us, whether we are good or bad, but better to be good and to find our way. So the opportunity for transformation exists all the time for us. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, I kind of, I, I mean, that was a lot of fun, what he did with the word atonement, but it is not what it means. Yeah, <laughs> it is, and it, uh, it shakes us up a little bit. Yeah. To understand that even though our mothers told us that we had to be perfect, uh, it isn't true. And perfection is not something that has to uh, be our goal. It's to be, as it says in Leviticus 19, Kiddushin Tehiyu, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The rabbis struggled with that too. And they said, our goal is not to be holy as God is holy. It's impossible. It's an ideal. But they said is you shall be humanly holy. Mm -hmm. And because the word is, it says you shall be holy, it's a constant process through the course of our life. When we come to our final day and our final hour, our final breath, um, it's to say, be able to say to yourself, I did the best that I could. And I made a difference. I contributed. I did a mitzvah. That's what it is. But if we come to our final day and say, I wasn't perfect. Oh, my gosh, I failed. Then, then we've missed the point. So as Buber calls his book, um, Darkoshel Adam, The Way of Humanity, it is to find our way and to be comfortable with the journey that we're on without regret except as a source of motivation. Yeah. Well, there's no such thing as perfect. Mm -hmm. The word itself it does not mean anything because who defines it? How do we define perfect? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, well. <laughs> we've been uh, and we've been we've been fed a whole uh, litany of perfection. Uh, what did you want on your test in school? Hundred percent answer. An A plus. The recital, yeah. the bar mitzvah, everything in your life needed to be. Even your job evaluations when your supervisor called you in, you wanted. How come I missed three points? <laughs> Why did I get needs improvement here? We've been driven by this. So in Hebrew, we don't really have a word for perfection. The word we use is shleimut. And shleimut comes from the word shalom, which does mean peace, means hello and goodbye, because we're really asking after your well-being. Shleimut is a sense of completeness or wholeness. And that's what we um, really should strive for. Yeah. You know, except in Judaism, we've been given a long list of 613 mitzvot that we should do. Yeah. And isn't that already, so, and many of which we can't do because they don't even exist anymore. But isn't that also setting you up for, failure? you know, I don't know if I'm to failure, but it's, a, it's something to strive for that it is impossible to yeah. reach. But, but again, let's go back to what the rap. So, so remember in, in Mishnah, it also says, it's not your obligation to accomplish all that needs to be done, but neither are you free to desist from trying. Yeah, and it's the yeah, effort love it. to, to do the mitzvot. There's 613 mitzvot in the Torah and many, many more beyond the Torah and the Talmud. So our goal is uh, really to get up in the morning and say, what, what mitzvah can I do today? And if you're in Musar groups, you know that Musar is, even if you live with a sense of gratitude, hakarat hakov, it's not to go around saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's to live with a sense of gratitude in your, in your heart and to get it as right as often as you can. And then Ricky, if you don't get it right, you don't flog yourself. You don't have to drag yourself into confession, but just yeah, say, oh, you know, I could have done it better. I could have done it differently. And if we're surrounded by people who appreciate and understand their own way in life, they'll forgive us. Uh, you know, in Judaism, the act of repentance, when you go to somebody and ask for them to forgive you, they need to forgive you. 
Because the real proof in the pudding is whether set with the same set of circumstances again in the future, if you do the same thing wrong. But if you do it better next time, then your repentance was accurate. If you go to the, if the person refuses to forgive you and you go a second time and they still refuse to forgive you, then you go a third time. And if they refuse to forgive you the third time, you know what? You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. What a terrible thing not to forgive somebody who comes three times sincerely um, to express forgiveness. And sometimes we have to let people go. There are people who come into our life. And there are people who go out of our life. And we go through stages. It isn't easy. But I will tell you, I had somebody years ago who was like a mentor to me until he became critical, became ugly. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to my wife, I'm done with him. I, that, that is not a person who's good for me. And she's saying, Yiddish, gay goes into Well, but far away from me. Move on without guilt. Actually, any guilt that I felt from was a motivation to be sure that I never allowed myself to be hurt again um, and that I would find better mentors in the future. David. I learned a great acronym, which is Q tip. Quit taking it personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. Yeah, it's hard to do. Yeah, it's hard to do. Oh, no, Q tip. But I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 One of the things I read in this book, I don't think in one of the chapters that we're covering, was where Buber talked about two kinds of souls, and that souls are sometimes born, some are better than others. I, you know, he, he put it, I guess, you know, carefully, that some are a little bit more complicated. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> like, we know that. Right? Yeah. Our sometimes, <laughs> when we look at children, um, you, there's a neshama you know, in a person. You can see the neshama, and that's the soul. And sometimes we say the neshama is, he's more like a mazik. <laughs> a little bit of an imp, you know, a little bit of a troublemaker. But everybody does have a neshama, but it, they're all redeemable. Now, the truth is, Judaism acknowledges that there are some neshamas that are seemingly unredeemable. But Judaism also says that even somebody who's done terrible things, death is redemption. So everybody has Is that a where they get don't speak ill of the dead or something? <laughs> don't speak ill, don't of, speak the ill of the dead. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, some people can't help themselves. So ultimately, life is not meant to be cruel to uh, what we do to others or even what happens to another. And somebody who is broken or, or sick yeah. and commits crimes, then death is redemptive. It's been a, a, the way of that person's life has been awful and hard, but there's redemption at the end for any soul. No. I mean, there have to be some things that are unforgivable. Yeah, absolutely. And there are. Okay. There are. All right, let's go back. Um, we're almost uh, to number six. So the teaching of the tale um, of this Midrash and this idea of the elixir of life and, and speaking good and doing good um, goes on. All who constantly torture themselves, Buber writes, with the thought that they have not been sufficiently penitent are primarily concerned about the salvation of their own souls. Mm -hmm. I think we understand that now. That is to say, with their personal fate in eternity. So if we're too overly concerned about it, we're, 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 we're misspending our time. Hasidism repudiates such a concern and draws only one general conclusion based on the teaching of Judaism. That conclusion differs in principle from the Christian axiom, and that's what I have on number six for you. It's a Christian axiom that is that the highest purpose of every person is to seek the salvation of the soul. And we know that because we live in Houston, Texas. <laughs> and if you're Jewish, somebody likely has come to you and said, oh, you're Jewish, then you're, then you're going to hell. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. right. A commercial. I am told you too. To? I'm so sorry. I'm praying for your soul. I said, please don't worry about my soul. I've got to go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, so in Christianity, salvation is critical. Me that it Faith must here. come first. <laughs> So in Judaism, I think I've shared with you before, in Milton Steinberg's book, Basic Judaism, he speaks of salvation. In Christianity, he calls it vicarious salvation. 
You give over your troubles and issues to Jesus, you're done. Go on with your life. <laughs> and Judaism, he calls it personal salvation because we are each responsible for our own salvation and wholeness by virtue of mitzvot, uh, connecting ourselves to the covenant and understanding as Buber is teaching us how to orient ourselves to the world. So salvation is in our own hands, but it's not, it's not something we get up in the morning and say, oh, what am I gonna do for my soul today? <laughs> Better you should be doing for somebody else's soul today. <laughs> in contrast, then Buber writes, Judaism holds that the human soul has no purpose for itself and no purpose for its salvation. The entire world created by God begins only as a physical shell and the service of every human soul is needed to make that shell spiritually vital. So just as I said, we don't get up in the morning and say, what am I doing to save my soul? We get up in the morning and we say, oh my gosh, there's a world that God's created. What is my soul going to contribute that is vital to making this world the way it ought to be. Our salvation is not found in amen and praise the Lord. Our salvation is found in using our vital spirit to animate a world that ought to be. And if at the end of the day, we can put our head down on the pillow and say, I made a difference today. I did something positive. I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't criticize anybody. And I can be at peace then God bless you, you've done what you're called to do as a Jew and as a human being on your path of humanity, okay? He goes on, then it can become God's realm. So in the place where we do that work and bring our soul to animate and bring something vital to that place, that's then, as Buber's always looking for God's presence, that's, as, as Jacob said in the Torah, God is in this place, and I did not know. So when you do a mitzvah, the Talmud says, when we do a mitzvah, heaven and earth touch. Oh, so, sweet. so in that place is God's realm. You don't have to look far. It's all around us. And Judaism believes that God is everywhere, uh, in everything. God is all knowing. And God, according to some, is all powerful. See? So Rabbi, uh, <clears throat> is the neshama um, can you talk, explain a little bit about whether or not the neshama transcends life? Go. Oh, well, that's kind of an afterlife <laughs> issue, which I'll just say, Judaism, as again, I said, that nobody's come back to tell us yet. But, um, you know, traditional Judaism holds that at the end of days, there will be resurrection of all the souls. So you think resurrection sounds so Christian. Well, that's where they got it from. Of course. They got it from us because Jesus was Jewish. That's right. So that's enough for Jesus. So <laughs> Reform Jews, um, we are, we, Reform Judaism emerged out of the Enlightenment and into an age of reason and rationality and science. So we can't, we, we uh, let go of the things that were too superstitious or too supernatural and focus on what we could see, observe, and duplicate. So what we could see is that the body went to the earth. From dust we came to dust we shall return. And we said the immortality, of, that we believe in the immortality of the soul. Because the body went here, what happened to the soul seemed, seemed relatively logical, that the soul returned to God who gave it. And we also say a good name endures beyond the grave. Right, mm -hmm. in a sense what, in a sense, when there is a memory, or when people remember your works, or thought of, in that sense, there's a train we transcend life. In the, in the yes, sense, in that absolutely, sense. and that's the only thing that we can say yes. factually, or at least verifiably, that the name endures beyond the grave, um, and the deeds that we remember um, cause the person's memory to live on. But um, so our prayer book, if you if you take note in the prayer called Give a Road, it speaks of God's power. The original ending of that particular prayer says, pray to you, God, ruler of the universe, who revives the dead, because <laughs> that's taka power, right? That's real power to revive the dead. But because Reformed Judaism rejected that as something supernatural, the, the um, 
edited version says, and the one that's been part of our prayer book for, for decades, over a century, until it was revised recently, says, praise you, God, ruler of the universe, Mechaye HaKol, who gives life to all. So that was the preferred version because that was verifiable. I can observe it. You're here, therefore God gives life to all. I will praise God for giving you life. But I haven't seen resurrection, so I couldn't pray it. But our prayer book now offers two versions because some co communities or congregations are a little more traditional than others. Right. Uh, in the time that we have left, let's uh, bring it to a conclusion. So um, let's see, let's uh, go on. Um, okay, so let's, uh, near the end of chapter five, it says, the, it, it's part of number seven. The greatest of all the Tzadi king who had been Rabbi Boonham's pupil, was the truly tragic figure of Rabbi Mendel of Kotsk. Once he spoke to the assembled congregation, this Rabbi Mendel. He says, what do I require of you? The rabbi speaking to his congregation, this is in a time and a place when congregations really look to their rabbis as the sole source of everything they needed to know. It doesn't happen today. <laughs> and that's the right this. What, am I, what do I require of you? Only three things. Not to let your eyes stray from your own way, not to spy into the lives of others, and not to have yourself in mind. Now, I, I have a little bit more to say that's than, it's at the end of chapter five. This means, first, Everyone must preserve and sanctify their own soul in its own fashion and in its own place and must not covet other fashions and other places. So in effect, be you. Be the one that God created. Each of us created in God's image is a wonder, a miracle, something special, a gift, a neshama. So we have whatever days are ahead of us are meant to be used to transform ourselves, become the I hate to say it, the best version of ourselves. It's so trite. I don't like that expression. Um, work on it. mitzvah, uh, transformation, forgiveness, all of these things. Second, everyone must respect the secrets of the soul of their fellow human. None may intrude upon the soul of their fellow human with impertinent curiosity or misuse its secrets. That is, let other people be who they need to be. There's a, 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 a 20, 21st century writer in um, India. His name is Nisi Ezekiel, Jewish. And he wrote for parents, protect, protect me from my secret wish to, to make my children over in my own image. <laughs> Let them dance to their own music, dissonant perhaps to me. Now, it applies from parents to children and it applies from us to anybody else in the world. Yeah. Be you. Um, but when somebody says, I'll be me, you be you, um, that's trite too. Yeah. It's too yeah. simplistic. Yeah. We have a responsibility to be for each yeah. other. But I can't be you, and it's not my business what motivates you, what animates you, what your intention is. We can only judge each other based on the deeds that we do. And if we come into a congregational setting, we find people who live according to the same principles and the same sense of goodness. And we like each, being with each other because we trust in what we're seeing and respecting and appreciating in each other. And third, everyone must be careful not to focus on themselves, whether in their inner lives or in their lives lived in the world. And the last one is simply to remember that you and I are not the most important things in the world. Now, that's different from what your Jewish mother told you. <laughs> uh, she knew in her heart she had an obligation to raise you to live and be the best you could be in the world and bring nachas and joy and honor to her. But the truth is, uh, we can only be the best that we can be, and that's the goal. So Buber in this chapter that's, that's called not to be preoccupied with oneself really gets to the heart of it. So as you go on your way, on your way of humanity, um, there's so many big ideals that we want to achieve. And I would let go of most of that because the truth is if you focus on the day to day, who you are, who you're becoming, how to forgive yourselves and use it as a motivation, you will accomplish the bigger things. Um, I can't tell you what it is, and you might not know what it is either, but that's between you and God. 
at the end of the day or the end of your days, and you say, God, I did all that I could do, maybe that still small voice within you will say, yes, you did all that you could do, and I'm grateful. So the covenant between us is something unique. Uh, the way of humanity is your own. As we learned last week, we all have our own unique ways of humanity, and as long as that way leads us to God, it's perfectly acceptable. Um, any questions? Any other thoughts? Just a comment. Please. It, it seems like in our effort being human. Speak louder, please. Louder. In, in, in our, our effort efforts, be, being humanly authentic is, is absolutely key. It is. It is. And I think today, of all days and times, we are challenged enormously to be not only authentic, but to know um, that we are authentic. Um, there aren't enough validators or systems of validation to assure us that what we're thinking, how we're thinking, what we're doing are right and also good. Because there are so many people out there right now who take up a lot of screen time, who are giving us the impression that being good isn't enough. We can be nasty too, and we can be other than we <laughs> think is appropriate and people get away with it. I would urge you um, to double down on what you know is right and good and valid and holy. And as long as we don't think about ourselves alone, there'll always be room for others. And I think that's a key to the future that we need to build for ourselves. Even in Israel, between Israelis and Arabs and Palestinians, uh, we have to take care of ourselves, but there needs to be room in a larger world for others to be who they need to be as well. So uh, just a reminder, um, February 8th, we'll continue with the chapter, chapter six, and it's called Here Where One Stands. I think it'll be a perfect way to conclude the three-part series to know where we stand. And there's a lot to say about that too as well. So we're right on time. Thank you everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everybody. Uh, special thanks to our Adult Ed Committee members and, and leadership for putting this series together. If you have other questions or ideas of other future programs, please let us know. Please let Steve Tamber know who's in the room, one of our co-chairs. Uh, on February 8th, in two weeks, will be our, our final session. Thank you, Rabbi Lyon. And then that weekend, February 9th and 10th, we'll be welcoming our next guest, a uh, scholar in residence, Dr. Gadi Tov from Israel, who will be speaking about uh, his experience and what's going on in Israel. He's a professor from Hebrew University, I believe. He teaches at the University. University. Uh, he'll be a wonderful, wonderful speaker. Yeah. He also writes for Haaretz, which is a left-leaning um, newspaper in Israel, <laughs> but he is not a left-winger. Um, I think he will be really, really <laughs> okay. inspired by what he has to say. So enjoy enjoy your afternoon. afternoon. Thank you. I also want to say a special welcome to Hannah Schiff, who is also with us. Uh, it's her first few weeks with us, and thank you for being our Director of Marketing Communications and all that you bring to the congregation, too. Ah, Thank you, Hannah. Thanks. Please say hello to her. Yes. I'm still haven't registered for Saturday night for a flight to family event. Thank you so wonderful the rest of your day. Continue eating and drinking and kibitzing. And also here. I'm basically I'm basically just the driver and driving. 